Hello, and welcome to another edition of Making It Make Sense, an investigative look into demystifying the tech we use every day. I'm your host, Aisha Hollins, and in today's episode, we will be talking cybersecurity car careers with Tracy Reed, cybersecurity architect, career mentor, security Linux instructor, teaching and mentoring the next generation of security professionals. We'll discuss the ins and outs of how to get into the field, some of the barriers and opportunities. And at the end, we'll be sure to share some essential resources. So be sure to listen all the way through. Tracy, it is so nice to have you on. How about you introduce yourself? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I am honored to be speaking with you today. And yes, my name is Tracy Reed. I have been in the cybersecurity career for quite some time now. I really got my start in the field in the mid 90s. Started off as a Linux system administrator, always had an interest in security. And especially in these last, I'd say, 15 years, as cybersecurity events have heated up, incidents have become more common, companies have started building out their own dedicated cybersecurity teams. I have definitely moved into really cybersecurity focused roles where I've been for a while now. And I've had quite a few different experiences, both technically and career-wise at this point. Oh, that, that's very interesting. I love to hear you say that because when you start talking about you were in it from the 90s, talk to me about some of the significant changes that you saw happen in the field of cybersecurity from when, when we first got started to where we are today. Things have changed a lot, of course. Uh, ransomware, the invention of cryptocurrency, which has allowed these kind of semi-anonymous, easy international payments. That has been huge. There has been a number of pieces of legislation that have come out in recent years that have right. really forced companies to look at actually doing security. You know, when I got started in my career, nobody really wanted to talk about security. It was an extra cost. They didn't need it. When there were incidents, it was an externality. It was somebody else's problem, even mm -hmm. if the problem originated because of something that happened on their network. Yes. And that has totally changed. Now there are so many high profile breaches. There's brand damage. There's major service outages. You know, we've been having hospitals and healthcare organizations unable to care for their patients because ransomware takes out their databases or whatever. Yes. And then you've got, you know, the legal aspect of it. So finally, the lawyers, <laughs> the corporate counsel are going to the board <laughs> and saying, hey, there's this, this legislation. And if this happens to us, we're going to be in big trouble. Yes. So now security is no longer viewed as an unnecessary cost center, as they say, but it is often something required to keep the business in business. Yeah. And another major thing that I've seen happen is, you know, historically, you know, a lot of people in the IT department were, were left in their cubicles while the sales team gets taken out on their annual sales kickoff to Hawaii, right? <laughs> those, those guys got all the love. That's right. Well, we still don't we still don't get nearly as much love as the sales team does, unfortunately. But a lot of customers are going to service providers, particularly SaaS and things like that, and they're saying, "Okay, if we buy your service, what assurance do we have that you're going to stay up and available and in business and that whatever data we share with you is not going to be compromised?" So now those customers are saying, "We require you to have a SOC 2 Type 2." certification for your company, right? Well, to do that, you need a security team. You need people like me to build the security controls, document it, provide the evidence for the auditors and continue to maintain and run it. So those are some of the big changes I've seen in recent years. I love I love everything that you're saying because it feels like you've been in my journey right along with me, right? So in my years of working with corporate, we actually had the exact same problem, seeing sales being taken out and being told that we were more, we were the cost for the organization. Right. We didn't make the organization anything. And so imagine, you know, being on the payroll or working for organizations always feeling like you almost needed to kind of apologize for being there, 
yet their technology wouldn't run. They couldn't do business without their tech, right? So I do see That's where right. conversations are starting to change. I do appreciate as as a as a, as a fellow techie, I appreciate that change, right? Um, but one of the things that I say, I've said it on uh, previous shows, um, cybersecurity, it's more like a buzzword. I feel like it's a it's a word that people like to throw around at parties, right? It yes. sounds cool. It sounds like something to say, but very few people really know what cybersecurity is and means and how it applies to their lives. So when it comes down to cybersecurity, talk to me about just how you feel about that being a fellow cybersecurity um, enthusiast, worker, um, someone in the field. How do you feel? Right. And, you know, I am still slightly uncomfortable with using the word cybersecurity. As am I've, I. I've... I have tried to make myself okay with it. I've largely succeeded. I bill myself as a cybersecurity person nowadays, but that's really a recent thing. You know, for the longest time, it was information security. It was computer right. security. It was risk management. It was information assurance. There, there have been all these different names. And, you know, that, that word cyber <laughs> right? That was popular in the 90s. Yes. We used to have cyberspace. We used yes. to have all these kinds of things. And that all went away because as technology becomes a part of our daily lives, it just kind of fades into the background, right? Well, you ever gone down the highway and seen those hotels advertising color TV, <laughs> air conditioning, things like that, right? That's no, nobody brags about that anymore. All that no. cyber stuff went away with the 90s, but well, there have, I believe it's largely the fault of the U.S. government, where there are a certain kind of people of a certain age who are our leaders now who remember that word cyber. And it's very, and it's among their circles, and that's where the money is allocated and the laws are written and so on. It has become, it may have always been popular. I don't know, because I don't run in those circles all that much. I just know what I read in the news. But that seems to be the buzzword they've picked up on. And you'll hear certain people uh, talking in the news about, oh, we're very concerned about the cyber. And what they mean by that is cybersecurity, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's where that's come from. And that's kind of my feelings on it. B because I, I have to tell people I'm into cybersecurity nowadays because that's the word in the media, because of, I think, this certain aspect of government. And that's what's marketable now. And when people go looking for skills like mine, nowadays they go Google or search LinkedIn or whatever for cybersecurity. I, I kind of wish it were some other way, but that's how it is. If you actually go to Google, there's a Google Trends, and you search for cybersecurity versus information security, you see information security tailing off that's just right. as cybersecurity is picking up. Yes. That's replacing yes. information security in our modern vocabulary. Well, if you think about it too, back in the 80s and 90s, as you said, the word cyber actually had a different con connotation. Remember? So, yes. and it wasn't <laughs> on the friendly side of the house, right? It was mm -hmm. the cyber world, cyber work. You know, there were certain things that led you to think um, salacious activities, not so much where we've taken it and made it and brought it into the business world and sat it down at the business table. Much like right. the word hacker, right? Right. You talk about, you want to talk, start talking pet peeves. And it's the way we throw around the, I've been hacked. Right. But have you though? <laughs> That's another one of my pet peeves, definitely. And I've talked at length about that in, 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 in other places and in my lectures and various things that I've done. I sometimes, I have occasionally referred to myself as a hacker. I try not to do that in the wrong audience, but sometimes it's a little hard to read the room. So then somebody says, you're a hacker? Aren't you worried about being arrested? And then I have to explain, okay, well, I'm a hacker in the classical sense of being a hacker. You know, go read Hackers by Stephen Levy, which explains, you know, the, the origin at MIT and 
exploring yeah. systems and solving puzzles and all these cool things. All that great stuff. Okay, well, what people find most difficult about um, cybersecurity is they don't, one of the things that they don't understand, not only is how it impacts them, right? But I get calls all the time. How do I get into the field of cybersecurity? What class should I start with first? If they even ask about a class, which certification should I do first, right? How do I get into the field? So I would love to know your, your thoughts, your feedback on instructing someone who's wanting to transition into this career. Right. So first, I always like to look at where are they coming from, right? Are they already in IT? Are, or are they just coming out of school or some other career and they're not really up on technology yet? The thing about cybersecurity is that, you know, the technology stack, as we call it, can be attacked at any level. That's right. Any piece of technology in our lives can be attacked or exploited or, you know, used to the benefit of the bad guys in some way. And it all talks to each other and it all interacts. So if we're going to be a security person and we're going to, you know, reduce risk or provide that security, we really need to have a very broad understanding of the entire technology stack. You know, you got to know how the computer works, how the network works, how the software works, how software is written. It's a very broad field. And my personal feeling is that if you want to get into cybersecurity, you need to get into IT or tech in general and learn the fundamentals of technology. How do microchips work? How do how does logic work? How, what's computer architecture all about? Learn a programming language, at least one. You know, one is probably, I always recommend more, but at least one. Uh, learn networking, learn TCP IP, learn HTTP, the web protocol that gives us all this web 2.0 interactive website stuff. I always, I tell people, and I, I try hard not to be a gatekeeper here. I'm not gatekeeping, yeah, yeah. but I tell people that in order to get into security, well, security is not really an entry level job. You really need to get into IT first, spend at least a few years there. I would say four or five years in any sort of IT, learning networking technology, all the things I just mentioned, learn as much of that as you can. Because the more of that you understand, at least the basic principles of how it all works, the more you will be able to understand how it can go wrong, how it can be exploited, and then how to secure it. So that's where I always tell people to start. Your first goal needs to be, before you break into cybersecurity, break into IT. I love that. I love that. So you said at least one programming language. Give me a yeah. language you would suggest. A program. My personal, language. my personal favorite for several reasons. It's the one I use most. It is the one most widely used in the security field for building tools and automation and things. And it's fairly easy to learn. So it's often recommended as a beginner's first language, is Python. I always recommend Python. Yes. first. Now, if at all possible, once you've learned Python, you know enough to build your own automation and solve your own problems, go learn some C and then go learn a little bit of assembly language so that you can know what that C is doing. And, uh, you know, then you've got a pretty good foundation, both for writing code to solve your own problems, but also you will understand how all these exploits work because it's really at the low level. I mean, the bad guys, the threat actors, whatever you want to call them, they are really ingenious. They are super smart. And the subtle problems they find to exploit are just amazing. And if you understand those three things, if you got Python, C, and some assembly language, you'll be able to look at any CVE or vulnerability report or whatever and understand the implications of what it's saying. And then you'll know, how to fix it or protect against it. So uh, just go with me here. What do you do and what do you say to those persons who, when they say that they want to do cybersecurity, 
they think that the end all be all of what we do in this industry is only hacking. That's all we do. What do you do to prep them that there's more to cyber than just hacking? Yes. And, and by hacking, I'm presuming you mean the the offensive kind breaking into stuff in this context. I want you to correct uh, anything I say wrong. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, we just had that. We, we've mentioned the classical sense of the word hacker, but right. I, I totally hear and understand you. I get that a lot also. Yeah. And that is the most sensational part. That is the part they depict in the movies. Yeah. Right. And that's sometimes what gets people's imagination going. And to be honest, you know, as a as a kind of child of the 80s, I remember war games. That's I remember, funny. you know, various other movies of that sort. Yeah. And even even as a, um, you know, an adult well in my career in the 2000s when The Matrix came out, that's all about offensive hacking or red teaming or pen testing or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And that's what gets people's imagination going. The issue with that is, of course, like most things in Hollywood, it is way dramatized. <laughs> uh, I have done some of that kind of work, always sanctioned, authorized, you know, paid for, of course. But yes. you don't you don't just sit at your computer, regardless of how smart you are. You don't just sit at your computer wearing your gloves and ski mask in a dimly lit room, banging on the keyboard. And then you say, <laughs> we're in. You know, it doesn't work yes. that way. It takes it takes hours it is the most i mean yeah it's fun and exciting when you have a success but for someone to sit there and watch it oh my god it would be so boring it is Brilliant. hours and hours of nothing <laughs> happening but frustration <laughs> that's right <laughs> but not only that and of course there was all the learning that had months or probably years of learning and study and practice to be able to get to where you can break into things and yeah, it's not at all like in the movies. And before anybody asks, no, I can't break into your ex-girlfriend's Instagram or whatever. I get all kinds of nutty things like that. It doesn't work that way. But in the context of careers, I also like to tell people that while, yes, there are people who are employed to do this, there are people who make a living doing this. They are very good in order to get hired on by one of the few organizations who actually employs people to do this, yeah. there tend to be certain big consulting and services firms who hire up all the really good right. offensive hackers. They comprise a very, very small percentage of all of the security jobs that are out there. Mm -hmm. Go look on LinkedIn or Indeed or anywhere they're advertising for open positions you're going to see a lot more SOC analysts, security engineers, security architects, vulnerability management, you know, uh, application security. There are, I would guess, between 95 and 99% of all the jobs out there are what we call blue team or defensive positions. You know, it, it only takes one person to tear everything down. It takes a lot of people to build things up. And that's what all these companies are trying to do. They're building up their defenses, building up their security controls. So it's, um, I would say it's probably a lot easier to get a job in the blue team or defensive side of things. Not to deter anyone whose passion is red teaming or offensive hacking. By all means, go for it. And it's, but it is a very niche specialty. Occasionally people ask me if I would like to take on this pen testing job for them. And I will almost always tell them no, because that is something that you really, to get your money's worth, you really want somebody who specializes in doing nothing but that. That is a very niche dedicated career in cybersecurity. Whereas I do a lot of defensive building security controls of all kinds. I've played with SQL map and Kali Linux and buffer overflows and all kinds of stuff, but mostly just, just to sort of keep an eye on the offensive side of things. So I know what I need to be defending against. And so just so I know how these things work and how things get broken into, but I am not necessarily totally proficient in the state of the art, such as somebody would need to be in order to be delivering valid you know, pen test results in this day and age. 
I agree. You said so many wonderful things. Like you said, a mouthful around a lot of really good things. But I know when we first got started too, you talked about with regards to cybersecurity and education, right? So there's this ongoing argument. It's education versus certification versus experience, rinse and repeat, right? So where, what side of the fence do you stand on? Education versus certification versus experience. Right. And that really depends on what kind of person you are and where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. I have been a big tech head since I was in high school. I do not have a formal education in cybersecurity. I am pretty much entirely self-taught. I did not even have any certifications until just these past few years where I'm I'm in a, you know, my my career, my mode of working has changed a bit where I've needed some certifications just for marketing purposes. But I I was pretty much self-taught. The number one thing you need before you look at education or certification or experience is passion, mm -hmm. right? Are you really interested in doing this? If you are, you'll be just for fun. Like for me, it was kind of always my hobby to be playing with computers. And that's how I taught myself all of this stuff. It is a whole lot easier if you enjoy doing it. It's a whole lot less work. It's a whole lot less like study. I don't really consider myself to have ever really studied security. It was just kind of if I had a billion dollars in the bank and I didn't need to be working or making anybody else happy, I'd still be here with my home lab, playing with my stuff and learning technology because it's fun. And that's really the number one thing I think you need in order to be able to get into or have success. Now, let's say you've already got the, um, the passion for it. Well, a certain amount of experience is going to become to you as a result of that passion. Like when I went out to get my first job, just for the heck of it. I built my own mail server, my own web server, my own DNS, set up my own whole infrastructure at home. Mm -hmm. Well, now I've got some projects to talk about. Now I've got some experience to talk about in that first interview, which really helped me out. So I think that's a couple things. First, you need some passion. As a result of that passion, you're going to be building your own experience, I would hope. Then, you know, I was never really a great student. I was never really the kind of guy to go to college and get a master's degree or PhD or anything like that. Yeah, I came down to San Diego and went to San Diego State University for two, three years, but I didn't graduate because the internet was taking off. The dot-com scene was taking off. I wasn't real stoked about being at school. I was spending all my time learning all this fun computer stuff, and that naturally translated into a job in tech. But if you are a a studious type, if you're learning all this technology, but you do want to go get a degree, by all means, go for it. it, it if, if I had the choice, I would love to be able to check that box saying that I had a degree. Now, a lot of the dot-coms and a lot of the smaller companies, really most companies in tech these days, don't care so much about a degree. But there's there are a lot of things about going to college which are good for you rather than just getting the degree. You know, that it does contribute to being a well-rounded person. I've had to seek that experience in other ways via world travel and studying spoken languages and other things that I like to do for fun that helps to round me out as a person rather than being 100% pure tech head. But yes, if you've got the means and the inclination, go to college, get a degree. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in cybersecurity. Most companies, you know, when they're looking for somebody with a degree, they just want to check the box. That's it. But in the vast majority of tech, if you have a demonstrated proficiency and given the shortage of people in cybersecurity these days, they don't really care if you have a degree or not. What it's good for is giving you a point above the other people in the process. If I had a degree, maybe I would have gotten some jobs that I didn't get. Maybe somebody else just edged me out in the interview process because, hey, we're both good technologically. We're both good in communicators, which is also very important, by the way, but maybe they had the degree and I don't. Okay, well, what if you do not have the means or the inclination to get a degree? Then I always say, keep keep up that passion, keep building that experience on your own or via a job, whichever comes first. 
And then as you learn, then go for certifications. Now, in the early days of tech, especially in the 2000s, I never really regarded certifications very highly. I met a lot of people with certain certifications who didn't impress me very much. And back then, a lot of the certifications were read this book, memorize the answers, take the multiple choice exam. Things have changed to some degree. You know, the big certification that everybody needs to have in cybersecurity, it's it opens doors. It's like, you know, to get a, especially like a mid to senior level position in cybersecurity, you really want to have your CISSP. And the thing about that cert, and I can't remember who said it, it was one of the popular CISSP educators. I wish I could remember who to attribute this to, but they said that it's a mile wide and an inch deep, <laughs> which which is true. <laughs> the books are massive. There's they so much are. stuff to cover. <laughs> now you don't go into like the super, super detailed technical level. In fact, a lot of it is about management, managing risk. It's somewhat technical, but it's a lot more management. And just the way they phrase the questions, it, it's just out of this world. It's not something you can memorize. You need experience. And that exam, you need to have four or five years, depending on whether you got a degree or not. If you got a degree, they'll cut it down to four right. to uh, years of experience to be able to sit the exam. That's right. So I always recommend people, yeah, if you've got the means and inclination, a degree is great. But even if you get a degree, you're going to need those certs. If you can't get the degree, build your own experience. And get the certs as you, you know, as you feel you're, you've leveled up enough in order to get them. So I decide that I want the mile inch deep cert. So I want to go after my CISSP or I want to become a certified ethical hacker or mm -hmm. I insert cert here. Do I really want to go the route of boot camp or do I just want to self-study? I, I hear that you have an opinion behind your opinion about boot camp. Yes. Yes. And there's actually a <laughs> couple different kinds of boot camps out there. There are the there are the certification boot camps, and then there are the career boot camps. Mm -hmm. Now, to address the question you initially asked, the certification boot camps, I believe. I I recommend studying on your own for as long as you can and have experience. Get get a few years of experience. It's going to be really hard to be brand new in the IT field and then go after some of these security certs. But once you've got a few years of experience, then you go out and buy a book, you watch the videos, you start studying up. And then depending on your feeling, like it's totally possible to get these certs without a boot camp. I mean, the people teaching the boot camp are teaching it out of the same books effectively that you can buy. Now, you might be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, teach yourself, read those same books and learn it on your own without the boot camp. If you are going to do a boot camp, and to be honest, I took a CISSP boot camp just before I took the exam because my employer was willing to pay for it. In, in the case of the CISSP in particular, there's so much material. We didn't cover anywhere near all of it during the boot camp. The boot camp was just to like really get my mind focused on fine tuning, learning the test taking strategies. So if you're going to do a certification boot camp, study as much as you possibly can on your own and then take the boot camp, then take the exam while you're hardcore into it. Um, now, there's another kind of boot camp. Yes. Talk and to being that I'm careers. in the cybersecurity career boot camps, yes. I am much more skeptical of these cybersecurity career boot camps. And being that I do what I do and I do a lot of cybersecurity career mentoring and education, my Facebook, my anywhere I go on the web, I am constantly fed with ads because they figure I am very interested in cybersecurity career boot camps. And I am, but not so much as a prospective student. But just the claims that some of these boot camps make just floor me. What I call it zero to hero in six, eight, 10 months, whatever. They make it sound like you can come into that boot camp with no experience in IT 
and then go through their boot camp, and now you're ready to be hired onto a job. I'm not saying that's never happened. I'm just saying it's very unlikely. It, and it just doesn't work that way. Uh, some of their claims, and actually there's some major universities advertising this sort of thing. And I have a bit of a problem with that. I I tend to recommend against those kind of boot camps. You have to, re- or at least really temper your expectations. It takes a lot of study, a lot of hands-on playing with the technology, learning it. And then I think you really need a few years in IT, help desk, system administrator, network administrator, something to learn how the technology works and then start studying security. And then maybe you've got a shot at that security analyst job or something of that nature. So let's be fair, let's be clear, um, because what I heard you to say, you know, they have boot camps that basically say you have either minimal or zero IT, and then you can come in and take their boot camp and be hired on. So zero to minimum IT experience, especially coming in and morphing into a cybersecurity role, is going to be difficult regardless. Being zero yes. with IT and taking an IT boot camp and coming in to be help desk or anything like that. Now, maybe that boot camp would be beneficial because that's you're much more feasible. Change. Yes. 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 But to come in and say, I don't know IT, I don't have, I don't even grasp the basics, i.e., I have no real security baseline, right? Knowledge wise or, or other. And I want to jump into this field. So I see there's one of my friends, um, he's he's all over LinkedIn, Joshua. I, maybe he'll love that I plugged him here. Not Josh Copeland. He has a, po- uh, a, um, a blog called Unpopular Opinion. And so oh. one of the things that he does a really good job. So I, I definitely encourage you to go out and see his blog. But one of the things that I look at is I find it almost entertaining when I see entry level cybersecurity person being hired, insert, as you said, all of those names. Do you agree, disagree? Do we really have cybersecurity entry level jobs? Well, it depends on what we mean by entry level. If by entry level, (laughs) we mean they've got a few years of IT experience and they've done some cybersecurity study and this is their first cybersecurity job, Uh then yes, it could be an entry-level cybersecurity job. But what most people think when they think entry-level, they think like entry-level career job, like your first Mm -hmm. job out of college or something. And again, not to be a gatekeeper, I want to encourage as many people and help as many people in as possible but cybersecurity itself is never really an entry level career. There you if go. you've been doing something else for a while, especially IT, then you may be qualified to get a cybersecurity job, an entry level cybersecurity job. But that doesn't mean you've, you know, just come out of high school or college. So talk to me about one of the scariest things that you've seen in your 25 years. And I know it's going to be hard to narrow it down to just one, but give me probably one of the scariest scariest experiences that that you've seen in in cyber you mean as far as like intrusions or career or career we're talking yeah we're going to talk careers talk to me about careers well actually there's a little bit of both i can tell you about i love it uh sometimes you sometimes there are judgment calls that need to be made for example i had this consulting client well, I'm not really a consulting client. They they were paying my company to host a secure infrastructure for them involving medical and insurance information. And when they came on board, they needed a security program. And the idea was that we were going to build that security program and get their infrastructure up to scratch. But throughout the course of a couple of years, they persistently refused to to do anything or spend any money to secure their infrastructure. We got it stabilized for them. It wasn't crashing all the time, but because that was the original problem they were trying to have solved. But then they just refused to do anything to protect their customers' information. And at that point, 
they had a couple of security incidents, including the website was broken into. They had some sort of database corruption, which was quite likely a result of the attackers getting in there and screwing with something. And there, that was starting to look like a lot of liability for us just being involved in this situation that we were dependent on them to correct. And eventually we had to say, sorry, we cannot have you as a customer anymore because you are going to get us into big trouble. So that that was one scary situation that we have seen. So and to by saying it's going to get you in big trouble, let's break that down. As I said, name of the podcast. Let's make it right. Make sense. What, what was most about- likely to happen was they were going to have some huge attack, some data loss incident, mm-hmm. and they were going to blame us for it. Does that, that was that, does was that actually happen? Do you have it, organizations that blame the the IS people for their issues? Well. The thing is, we were a separate company. We were like a managed service provider being paid by them. Now, if we were their direct employee, I wouldn't be really concerned about liability at that point. We're operating under their umbrella. They can't sue themselves. But as we were a separate (laughs) company, and and the word lawsuit was used once. And at that point, we're like, okay, we're going to protect ourselves. And we're going to get ourselves away from this situation as quickly and cleanly as possible. But- That, as far as careers go, that's kind of an unusual situation because I was almost like I was a uh, a partner in a company at that point that was providing that service. As far as careers go, there haven't really been very many scary situations. Like tech, tech is a very unstable. Well, I wouldn't say it's unstable, but. There's there's always work out there. There's reliably been work out there. My whole career, with a little bit of a, a little bit of a dip during the dot com crash when there are a lot of tech people on the market, but that's the first time that and only time that's happened. You know, since there's been a tech industry, um, so I would say the first time you get laid off or fired if things just weren't working out, and if the first time that that happens. And it will happen if you're if you make this your career, you know, we we don't work for the same company for 50 years and then get a pension and a gold watch anymore. That just doesn't happen. And I would say the first time that happens to you and you learn the lesson that I really need to run my career like a business and not necessarily take things personally, then, um, you know, I think I think that was a, a real eye opener as well. Okay. All right. This has this has been amazing. I have so enjoyed our time. Are there any tips or tools you would like to give those that are entering into the cybersecurity careers, um, be that education, be that different things that they should look for as far as in the cybersecurity space? Like in your 25 years, what's the best tip you'll give someone that's listening? Best tips I can give are to be passionate about it, to be interested in the technology. That's that's your number one tool, your number one weapon there, your biggest key to success. Um, run your career like a business. You know, uh, it's it's a competitive field out there and you have every right to charge what the market will bear for your skills and services. And that's exactly what the companies you are working for are doing with their customers. And always be keeping up on current events. Cybersecurity is changing all the time. A very popular interview question is, tell me about something that's happened recently. Tell me about a recent exploit or or intrusion and what kind of security controls you would put in place to prevent that. I have seen that kind of question so many times. (laughs) So that's, that's a big one also. Great. All right. So the name of our show. Making it make sense, right? Um, One of the passions that I had around starting this was so often, as I said, we take things, we throw the, the, either the adage around, the acronym around, the word around, and we don't necessarily, it's not been broken down to its base level that we can grasp it. And we had that aha moment. 
Can you tell me about something in the world of technology? It doesn't have to be cybersecurity. Matter of fact, maybe it doesn't have to be in tech at all. Something that did not make sense before that people felt were commonplace, that you finally had your aha moment and now it makes sense. Something where I finally had my aha moment and now it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, in, you know, in tech, there have been lots of times where you finally figure something out and you understand how it works. But I think you're looking for something a little more broader than that. I think really, again, it was when I decided that I needed to run my career more like a business and have a look at the broader picture. For a long time, I was very interested in the technology. I was very heads down in the technology. Always did a good job. Always wanted to do a good job. But especially in these last five or 10 years, I have definitely taken a broader look at things. Um, you know, One of the things I tell IT people or security people is that security is there to enable the business. Security is not there to be what I call the department of no, right? <laughs> telling people no. You can't be telling people no all the time. You've got to help the business to grow. Yeah. And I think there was a point when I finally understood that the owner of the company will be making the decisions as to what's an acceptable level of risk and what's not. If we say, I don't recommend we do this, and they say, we're going to do it anyway, well, your conscience is clear, right? If your business gets broken into, if something happens, you recommended against it or you advised what the actual risk was and they accepted the risk, you can sleep well at night regardless of what happens. And I think that as a cybersecurity person, that was another point where I thought, okay, that's kind of a, a totally different way of looking at things. And I think that is something that security people need to understand. I have actually been brought in to replace a couple security people who just didn't get it and were actually inhibiting the business. So that was an eye opener. I love it. I love it. Well, Tracy, it has been a pleasure having you on today, talking to you, understanding more about what you do, um, getting those tools and tips around uh, cybersecurity careers, as well as cybersecurity education. Um, if you could, please tell our audience, how can they get to know a little bit more about you? Because I know we failed to mention your organization is actually Unrisk University, right? And so, that's right. Yes. So tell us a little bit more about your organization and how our audience can reach you. Right. So we have a couple different things going on. Our, our main webpage is unri.sk. So it spells unrisk, not .com, but unri.sk. Traditionally, I have been involved in the business of selling my cybersecurity consulting services, helping people secure their clouds, secure their containers, run their vulnerability management program, run their security program in general. But in recent years, Unrisk has branched out into leveraging our own cybersecurity career experience into helping other people get into the cybersecurity field. So we've got a few different you might call them products and services that we offer. We have a free cybersecurity career accelerator Facebook group where you can chat with me and I post helpful tips and things regularly. I actually sell a class on breaking into cybersecurity, which includes a few of the things I've mentioned here, as well as a lot more discussion about degrees and certifications and getting experience and office politics specific to cybersecurity and all and how to grow your career and <clears throat> how to advance in salary and responsibility. And that can be found at our Unrisk University page where we offer our learning products. That's learn.unri.sk. And recently uh, we are we are currently in the pre-launch phase for people who are in IT or cybersecurity, we have a resume distribution service where I have a database of around about a thousand, maybe slightly more now, 
IT and cybersecurity recruiters. The vast majority of my like nine to five jobs and contracts and things, pretty much all of them have come via recruiters. Recruiters have been a very powerful uh, force for me to leverage in getting work. So if I find I have availability on my schedule, I'll send an email out to my network of recruiters and they have never failed to get me a job within a pretty short period of time. So I have decided to make that database available also for, uh, so it's a service we offer now where you can send me your resume and we'll have a brief chat and I'll learn something about you so that I can write you some, a little recommendation. And then I can send a blurb about you and your resume out to my network of a thousand recruiters. So that is something that we are just launching right now. So those are a few of the kinds of services we offer. And there, there are some various other ancillary things that we sell on learn.unri.sk also, but those are the ones I am most enthusiastic about now because they are helping other people to get into this field where they can take advantage of my experience. How exciting. Congratulations. That sounds like so many wonderful um, things that you're doing to give back to the community. I applaud you. I congratulate you. Um, we in the cyber industry, we support you. Um, and so thank you again so very much um, for being on today. Again, my name is Aisha Hollins, and this has been another episode of Making It Make Sense. You guys have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.